played the uh, Nautilus. Yeah. And Chris, do you have the Nautilus tracks from past drives? There you go. Uh, from Nautilus tracks from past dives? Yeah. I don't have it handy. Okay. Um, Yeah, that would be something I could have Rennie help out in the data lab. Dig some of that up if you need it. Yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt. All right, stand by. And so it looks like, yeah, those uh, sketch fab, um, that it's viewable right now, and they will uh, be available for download soon. Taylor Ann, you were saying something about what we had most recently uploaded? Yeah, we also have, I believe, a model of the columnar basalts with the goosefish and then some coral fans that we saw the other day, I think during dive oh, age 2017. Oh, cool. Some yellow coral fans and pink coral fans. Um, I think that was the latest model that we were uploading. Um, we also have been trying to upload to Cesium Ion, which is essentially a platform that's similar to Google Earth, but different. And you can zoom all the way in um, to where the exact location of that the dive site um, we were at was and look at it in a 3D. Wow, that, that's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be really great when we can start uploading all of our amazing models to that. Yeah, and one of the things that the data lab has been working on is making the process of processing all of this data, all of these images, making it as efficient as possible. I'm not sure what their running time is on how quickly they'd be getting them out, but honestly, we left port last Sunday. The fact that they've been able to get anything uploaded is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> um, so uh, a, a viewer is asking, do we know if uh, the seamount is actively erupting? Um, it is active. Um, it's not, doesn't look to be erupting right this minute. <laughs> But it does appear to be actively venting uh, heated seawater uh, back into the uh, back into the ocean at different locations, and that changes all the time, apparently, depending on where the hot spots are underneath the caldera. Like any active volcano, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. I'm just thinking in a couple million years, there'll probably be some great hiking spots. <laughs> That's true. I keep thinking about what we're looking at. We're looking at future Hawaiian real estate that will undoubtedly sell for top dollar. Or possibly be a sanctuary, which would be really cool to let, that, you know, yeah, a new that would be island. There you go. Much better use of, yeah. Yeah, let a new island and just see what life happens there. It would be a really great study, actually, to see what happens naturally. Yeah. It would indeed. This is an awesome view from the uh, Triclops camera. You can see kind of underneath the formation, which is uh, what you're looking at on uh, channel three right there. You're looking at as pilot error. And <laughs> Dan is blowing on it. <laughs> Oh, wow. Look at and that. Jonathan the pirate has entered the van. Again, some absolutely spectacular uh, basalt textures. I always saw one of the most exciting parts of the work that you do here on the Nautilus is the fact that you not you allow anyone in the world to experience what you're seeing, what the sub is seeing, what you're working on in real time through what Dr. Ballard calls telepresence. And you also allow the scientists who thought of the idea, who created the dive that you're working on to uh, be back in their laboratory, back in their home, uh, state their home uh, office, their home lab, and and look at what you're seeing and help analyze in real time what it is that the sub is seeing. It's extraordinary and undoubtedly going to become the standard in the future. 
Yeah, uh, one really cool thing that I've just really appreciated is knowing the reach that this has. My best friend works in an ecology lab in, uh, in San Diego, and apparently her advisor or her professor uh, said that this is what he watches when he's working, just to feel that exploration nice. feel, you know, in <laughs> real time, even when he's working in a lab. Uh, so we have a question that says, to hike this area, will the area go up out of the sea or the sea level go down? Ooh, that's a great question. So yeah, we expect this uh, seamount to continue growing as it is active. It's a great question. I suspect it would rise and go up more rapidly than the sea would uh, would go down. Yeah, especially, and but right now we're at, we saw a peak at about a thousand meters, so it'll still be quite a while before it's above ground. So like, yeah. like we said, a couple million years. <laughs> a couple years. million years. Um, but it's still really amazing to be able to see that kind of thing that we've only, that we've been able to live on, you know, in its earliest stages. And uh, a viewer saying that they read about the six skill uh, Stingray could that you, could you just zoom in right on that little structure right in the middle? Sorry, say again. Just zoom in on the the top of that iron structure in the middle. Right. right there, right what you got in the middle of Zeus. No, a little a little up, little not, not that rock, not the rocks. It's, it's, it's the one that looks like a little layer cake there. There you go. Got it. I'm, I'm just quite out. curious of what that is. It looks round, you see. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. See it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All that yeah, well, that's. It looks pretty dramatic. What's Larry even looking at, huh? There's awesome. nothing here. It does look like a little miniature volcano, though, in my. Right. Oh. Duster, duster, duster. Oh, and a viewer saying, and you let us, the general public, sit in and even ask questions. Oh. I don't know why it's doing that. I have we no appreciate you too. Yeah, we do this for you. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. You. That's yeah. like my favorite part of this job, honestly. Other than bugging Taylor Ann and asking questions. And also Aww. zooming. <laughs> I love a zoom. Uh, somebody said, I doubt that any of the seafloor will reach the surface at this depth. This stuff is going to be underwater or buried under a ton more lava. That's probably That's true. Great note. Um, yeah. Jeez, I haven't stirred it up that bad in a while. It's my dust cloud catching up to me. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about. Storm. One of the things we talked about earlier was uh, when I think my microphone was off, and I want to be sure to, and it's worth repeating because it's such an extraordinary fact is that the entire volume of Earth's oceans is sucked into yeah. these hydrothermal, uh, and hydrothermally altered uh, by the nope. mid-ocean ridges, I'll by these back. volcanic calderas like this, and then it is, it is returned to the ocean. So the entire ocean circulates within these vents every six million years. Uh, it's an, it gives you an idea of the scale when we see here in this caldera in Hawaii, these what seem to be very small hydrothermal vents with a little, little bit of hot water coming out. When you look at the global scale, it's so immense that it circulates the entire volume of the Earth's oceans every six million years. And that's what created the Earth's chemistry. And that's something else that Dr. Robert Ballard has contributed to the pool of human knowledge out there with the help of other scientists. But it was Dr. Ballard that discovered black smokers, hydrothermal vents in the Galapagos, and it now turns out they're an extraordinarily fundamental part of uh, the chemistry of the ocean and the chemistry of life on Earth is what we're seeing here today on the Nautilus, and you're witnessing it live through telepresence 
at NautilusLive.org. Um, Chris and Dan, if we can come up to 1160 meters and just follow that contour around, I think we're uh, in, okay. in the best spot for us to do anything. 1160, Reja. This uh, pattern in the rock is really cool. Yeah, continuing on my ice cream. Yeah, I do hate to leave that beautiful pattern, but I, th mm -hmm. but I think um, you can, uh, maybe the, sure. la the last report of uh, good Vensight was at the 1160 meter Roger. contour in this quadrant. We don't have a position, but in this quadrant of the pit. Yeah, continuing on with my ice cream metaphor, those uh, <laughs> those those guys look like the like yep. chocolate fudge go, frozen uh, <laughs> on top of ice cream. Uh, hey Dan. No. Nope. Are the uh, are the two cameras racked all the way out? No. Nope. Bridge up. bridge nav two zero meters zero six zero. Everything's uh, racked in. And uh, going back to just, you know, how wide the reach of the Nautilus Live is, um, my family texts me while I'm on watch, <laughs> and they comment so on the things OBS that I say. So OBS is uh, giving you grief <laughs> there again, Jonathan. So it's a good way for us uh, on board on to stay in touch. Just on the predicted 212 computer. There it is. Larry, do you have a preliminary idea or hypothesis about what these periodic little deposits of white might be that we're seeing? Um, Dan? White or yellow? I'm, see, I'm seeing yellow there. But what, what do you think Dan. those are and what causes them? Well, I, th I think the, the yellow we're seeing uh, are more the, the sulfides that have been precipitated that we see quite ubiquitous on the upper part. And here it's just... Um, Lar larger pieces of it that have kind of accumulated down below. I think the it, it's probably more evidence that the the venting activity is on the walls, probably precipitating the material on the wall. But as that starts to accumulate a little more, it gets a little thicker. Some of the pieces will fall off and get captured here. There you go. Perfect. Whoa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're getting a quick view of the pumpkins there, too, uh, for okay. those of you on Pumpkin Watch. Um, I don't mind if they're they're all the way out. You can let them, you can let them flop. Um. <laughs> so we had a question uh, I can't about hear if you're saying anything. Still, still can't hear you, sir. Where are you, Jonathan? SPL and pilot, both. S huh? Is I'm on SPL and pilot, and I'm sitting down at side left. Uh, I wouldn't get you on side left. I'm on SPL now. I Red. think uh, it might be wise to keep them on three rollers there. Otherwise, the whole thing is uh, on a quarter-inch bolt and shear. All right. So Where's can you do an right experimental? Uh, can you turn off the mids? Maybe another little bump there. And you can keep the, to be clear, you can keep the ship moving and do everything, but if we're going to be yeah, doing ship, a little bit of a transit, Larry, ship's moving, yeah. I'd like to just uh, mess around as within the time bounds of the transit to uh, with some lights. Is that sure, okay? sure, right. absolutely. Yeah, yeah so uh, since it's nice and flat and open, um, yeah, exactly. And then maybe can we just try uh, just the starboard light, see how that looks? going to blow it out unless we swing the manip out. Um, so we had a question about uh, uh, the chemistry of the ocean. It's up to you. I'd love to try it since uh, it's kind of open. I don't want to uh, do that while we're moving the ship and the winch. We have the wounded winch. And oh, uh, wounded winch don't. again? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so is this just mids or is this mids and high? Uh, mids and uppers. And that's not that's not half bad at all. No, it's kind of how we planned it. Right? Yep, exactly. Can you just humor me in just uppers, just for a half second? Let's see how much we lose on the bottom edge there. Nah, too much. Yeah. We, we, we lose too much and don't gain anything at all. 
Okay, I'll tell you what. Okay. Um, uh, let me see what happens when I poke this out a bit. Let's yeah, that's the difference there. Of I don't like it. I pull him back. Pull him back to the three safeties. There you go. You see him just pick up there. Yep, that's okay. Yeah, okay. They it, the roller wasn't designed to come out that far. Yeah, we're good. Not without much weight. Kind of labored on it. And Chris? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we need to go to that waypoint zero. I think if we just head due, uh, due east to uh, 1160 and then... Yeah, I'm, I'm just climbing the contours to 1160. Right, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so what I'm going to try to do here, um, I'm going to start recording with both of the uh, starboard and port uh, stereo cameras. All right. So... Um, is this for immersion or, or for photogrammetry? This will be for immersion as we're okay. we're heading across so here. Starboard and port can see each other. Uh, that's okay. We'll remove that in post. One of the famous last words right there. Yeah, I kind of like no. the lights on the view. On the I actually do. You have to you have to embrace the fact that we have the lights. You know. Yeah. It's an ROV. That's just what it is. So. It's part of the BBC shot. I ah, have, absolutely. Sorry, the Nat Geo. <laughs> Ew. Um, so we had a question about the chemistry of the ocean. Okay, the so water in your I'm recording now, so I'd say head forward with all haste. Does it display a variation in pH or trace minerals? The rapid speed of yes, very, very much so. Um, the, the or maybe I should allow the ship to kind of head up and, and over. When it was first sampled after the collapse in 1996 Before or I start so, recording, what do you think? Um, uh, no, the we're just we're not at Atlantis, very so noticeable differences be, in the uh, chemistry of the water. I said the CO2 so contents we were extremely uh, straightforward, extremely okay. high. And then maybe can we? Um, well, if you if you don't mind, could we try to do a so lights really off entirely on her to see if there's and enough light at this iron and very high at this at this delta? Um, and somebody's commenting on the ashy-looking material. I nope. There is not enough light at this delta. <laughs> <laughs> Don't panic, everyone. We turned off the lights for an experiment. All right. Well, that's that's a solid no. Good data. <laughs> 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 uh, the light will get a little better there as yeah. uh, cinema cam as we start coming up the hill. Um, yeah, that right ashy there. stuff is probably we're the, stuff that the, the white stuff that you were noticing, right, Larry? Yeah, so yeah. It, yeah it's, it's, it's all, it is the precipitate yeah. of, of, of Okay, events. so um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to just start, I'll start uh, recording on the cameras, okay? Jonathan, you should start recording on the cameras. All right, I'm gonna, actually, Judge I'm going to, I'm going to allow uh, okay, I'm gonna put Dan, move, Dan, why don't you call action Ridge, when you Ridge, have this all set up? Zero, six, zero. Okay. Uh, are you ready, director? Yep. Lights. <laughs> cameras. Action. I guess it should have been the other way around. Action, lights, cameras. Or something. Uh, that's <laughs> true. And then now the ROV is just kind of like wobbling around. So, I mean, I think next time maybe lights, camera, action when you're flying. Yeah. Yes. Or, uh, and you lost your uh, port stereo camera. There. Oh, that's sad. That's because I have them in easy link mode. Um, oh, well, we'll have to live with that. So the reason we lost one of the cameras is I actually have set to be able to record these for kind of the stereo 3D. The two cameras have to be uh, linked together so they yeah. match the time code. I think it's just an OBS. If you refresh OBS, you'll get it back. I think so. Yeah, that's the uh, that, that issue we saw where you hit record and the... Uh, sure, let me go check it out. Here we the go. The on the right is good. The camera uh, on the left is... Uh, that's negative, that's, sir. That's a restart of OBS. I mean, try it all the way? Yeah. There we go. It does the same thing, by the way, on my... Uh, Raspberry Pi cameras, Does or it? web cameras, or whatever, whatever I'm feeding it. It'll nah, see the stream just doesn't exist now for two one. Uh, I think it's because it's in the slave mode. Interesting. So somebody was asking why the pumpkins are not floating. They're actually tied down to the porch, uh, and they're in a mesh bag. It's 
So you can keep it moving, Chris, till we hit the wall. Roger. Just uh, gentle moves, though. Yep. Okay. Do we... Can you uh, maybe increase standoff distance by about a half meter from the bottom? Sure. Yeah, that looks, that looks much better. I can't wait to see how this looks. Yeah, we should have done this when we were in the bottom of the caldera there. It would have been wicked. Much, uh, this is kind of... Yeah. I don't know if you caught any of the images on the bottom there. It was very striking. Oh, yeah, no, we did, we did some beautiful time-lapse photography on that. And um, I have the computer running right now for kind of the real-time photogrammetry element should be quite exciting. Um, it's uh, processing through the first 5,000 images of this dive. Breach, breach nav, another two zero meters. We had a question from a viewer about when they would be able to download this stuff on, this stuff on Sketchfab. On this dive? No, like any Challenge of accepted. Stuff, any of it, like, cause it, they, I think that they're only viewable. From no, what they should all be downloadable. Okay, no? somebody wrote in that they were viewable, thank you for that, but uh, when will they be flagged for download? Oh. For the viewer that asked that, how about you give me, you give like me two minutes? Like 20 minutes, minutes ago. <laughs> Hopefully they're mm -hmm. still watching. Of course they're watching. How could you uh, not? So how deep would you have to go to have the pumpkins be crushed, honestly? Uh, surprised that they can withstand the current pressure. So we don't think it's the depth that's really uh, not crushing our pumpkins. We think it's because um, they're actually like pretty much all water anyway. Um, so it has to do with that and, and uh, how porous they are. That's, that, that's what we were discussing earlier, but uh, Dan has given us hope that they might explode or implode on the way up. <laughs> Time will tell. Since we're uh, reaching the end of the watch here, and we haven't really uh, done the, the Halloween costumes, oh. and we have three, three dare I say, excellent costumes in the van right now. Do I need to put my crown back on? Jonathan, Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Jonathan, do you mind if I switch to van cam for a minute to show off? Uh, he's talking to Rennie, I, I think, oh. so give him a second. All right. Well, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to deprive the viewers, so I'll wait until... Okay. Until Jonathan gets I'll back put, on. I'll put my crown back on. Because it was kind of hurting me with my headset. It has been a struggle to keep this headband on, let me tell you. You, I must say, you are rocking it. Thank you. And then, um, Slomo's here too, but his hat is in my backpack, which is in the studio. <laughs> but he's got the rest of it. Uh, will there be any highlight videos of the caldera? I hope so. Yeah, probably some of that shimmering water and maybe yeah, the... Yeah, I definitely did highlight that. Yeah. Um, I also highlighted the six-killed stingray. Oh, yeah. And some of those rock formations, the one that had those uh, tubes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Did you so highlight any of, like, the flow, the lava? Yeah, I highlighted awesome. and I put rope lava. Rope lava, yeah. yay! Yes. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so hopefully those will be put online. Um, so so one of the viewers is saying that there's going to be a crack on the base of the pumpkins and they're going to be full of water. Well, they aren't carved, they're, and they're very small. They're just, um, they're the best that we could find in Kona when we were doing Operation Pumpkin. Three people went to shore and, and uh, executed Operation Pumpkin. Oh, great. The, 
those Sketch Fab viewers still watching. Uh, cool. I'm going to crab up the hill a little bit, Chris. Roger. Or should I go, you want to go for an orbit or for? Doesn't matter. Jonathan, the viewer, uh, is still watching about the, with the question about the sketch fab. Uh, Roger. And Manel is wondering if she can show off our costumes. If she could show Rage, off Rage our costumes. Have another two zero. Of course. And that, where's your hat? I don't know. I already lost it. Oh, so You're fast. Gonna, uh, come up five if you uh, want. That did not take long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> so here's Slow Mo. He's wearing his pirate costume. He's missing his little hat. It's in my backpack in the studio. And ta da. I am Ursula. And Jonathan's wearing a great pirate costume. Yeah, I, sort of, I kind of wish Jonathan would stand up really quick. Yeah, Jonathan, could you give us a... Nice. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I feel more like the Phantom of the Opera right now. <laughs> you need the Yeah, mask. you really do need the, the hat. No, 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 And then no, I'm going to... No, no. You can see some of what I do here in Channel 3. I'm going to pan over. To no, my no, little no, seat in the no, corner. No, 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 yes. No, no. And I'm Medusa. Yay. Hi, no, 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 no. <laughs> Can you guys uh, take it easy on the chat back here? We are Copy that. approaching the side of the caldera. <laughs> ah, there we go. Download. Free. Oh. Download. Free. All right. Save. Come up, uh, come up, ten, please. All right. They're saying the Phantom needs a mask. Well, that is true. Basalt wall. Right, so this is, this is intriguing too, how we have this uh, real contact between heavily stained material left and left heavily stained material and, and uh, much less stained material. So our plan now is to try to rise up to 1160 meters. There have been uh, early reports, uh, certainly after the, after the initial collapse in 1996 of a, a vent field, a very hot vents, what they call forbidden vents. Um, at a depth of 1160 meters. We don't quite have a position, we just have a kind of a quadrant um, of the pit that it's in. So we're gonna, what we're doing now is coming up to 1160 meters um, and then we'll, we'll move around that contour as best we can and see if, see if we find something there. Allow AR. Actively changing settings on our Sketchfab to allow downloads and the viewing of our objects in AR. How neat is that? Oh, is that Hercules? You can print 3D print Hercules? Well, you can view Hercules. That is not exactly an optimized oh. model for 3D oh, printing. If anyone is out there and would like to optimize our model for 3D printing. So you have to do something to, to optimize it for printing? Is that Well, yeah, this, this model has too many. Too many bits. It has. Unless you want to 3D print every bolt and washer. Yeah. You're so probably going to need to do a little yeah. work on that one. And for that matter, actually, this is old Herc. I still need to get that new Herc. Oh, yeah, we were going to trade new Herc for. I put it on the server. For Nautilus, weren't we? So these are pretty spectacular. Yeah. Here, Jonathan. So I'm going to start recording on that. Thank you. Looks like we're kicking up a little something there. Oh, 
Uh -huh. We got to thank you. Do you want to chill Jonathan. for a second or keep moving? Uh, let's chill for a second. All right. Okay, come up on the way. Well, I'll say something. This is pretty spectacular 3D footage we're getting right now. Watching Dan slow and masterful piloting as we ascend the ridge and gracefully glide over the top to depths unknown and unexplored. bit of a psych out. I thought that the clip was done, but it was not. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's got a way to go. Chris, I'm making the assumption the high pack survey map is north up. It is north up, yes. Good, okay. So what we're going to do when we get to 1160, and I think actually if you keep on the vector you're at, you're actually heading to that waypoint zero. That's fine for what we want to do, because uh, what we want to do is if we can move mm -hmm. south along the 1160 contour. South along the 1160, Roger. Yeah. And if we make the complete circle and don't find <laughs> anything. Um, do we have plans on visiting another one of the pits? Or? No. no, 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 no. So we're going to stay That's in this one, Pele? This one pit, yeah. And do we feel pretty good about the Norbit map that we've gotten? I, I saw them floating up to the surface again for more orbiting. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think Chris, you got a, a... Yeah, I think we got a, a great really one good, for this. really good data set. Uh, yeah. I've heard that's a real disadvantage of the sonar, is that just how intensive it is to collect that data and why optical might be a more yeah, efficient well, way. It's, it's oh. funny, because it's, you know... <laughs> All right, come on. Hundreds, of, hundreds the, of square meters. Let's bring it back in the room, people. We're okay. um, on the side of the we have a question Roger. for you, okay. right, John. Right, hold on, hold on a minute, really please. Hold on. We just brought back to reality by our pilot Dan, who does have quite a bit of what ROV pilots call jewelry, i.e., the, the cameras hanging quite perilously over the. And we also need to communicate with uh, people on the deck and people in the front row, and I can't do that with the. Yeah. A lot of dynamics here. Ships moving, winches moving. Jeremy yeah, Evan. And the ship's been stopped for a while, so Atalanta's moving very slowly. Yeah. Absolutely insane blade. Yeah, the, the, the first one was even narrower than this. It was... Wow. So I hope you're getting all this. I am. Uh, this is going to be incredible. This is potentially one of the uh, one of the real strengths of doing true stereo work is exactly this scenario. Being able to appreciate the... And this will make an exceptional three-dimensional uh, 3D printed model. 
That's correct, sir, yeah. Look, look at how thin it's getting now. That it, it really is spectacular. There have been a number of these kind of blade-like promontories uh, coming uh, from the collapsed pit wall. Okay, roger. Bridge, bridge nav, 10 meters, zero, six, zero. I might regret that. That's a really beautiful counter spin you're doing right now, Dan. That's incredible. There's a fish for you. So, Larry, this was formed by the collapse of a portion of the caldera. Could you kind of explain that? It's a really interesting feature, and you could describe how this was probably formed. Yeah, I can't. I I, I can't speak to exactly these blades, but uh, the the overall process is that we had a a, a, cald a caldera here with a, a relatively flat top to it. Um, with shallow magmatic activity, magma coming up. Um, and at some point, there were, well, 1996, there was some major seismic activity, which implied some movement of it magma. And coincident so with yeah. that activity, um, the plug of magma that was under that part of the flat caldera withdrew. Um, and uh, that left a void that collapsed. And so I think the rubble that we see on the bottom was, represented the surface of that plug of magma that was uh, in contact with the surface, with the ocean water at the time, or near it, cooling. And then uh, when I, when I came around. what we're seeing on the sides um, are the remnants of the original lava flows that formed uh, underneath or were part of the building of the entire uh, seamount. And so you get this collapse pit. Me, I thought I could come back with around. both the rubble and these remnants of the walls, or track, potentially built up if, if the magma pulled out slowly, um, they could be built up. I just stopped recording. Layer by layer. <laughs> Completely ruined the shot. You're fine. We got that shot. That was beautiful. Sorry, I'll come back around. And I thought I could get the inside too, but I'm leaving that dust trail behind me. So. Quite a bit of current based off of the dust, huh? No, it's because I'm thrusting left, so all the all my dress wash is going off to the right. So. Oh and wow! Look at the. That's the, quite a beautiful feature, though, in the forward. The cliff is really soft, so even from miles away, I stir it up. What's the white? Yeah. What's that whitish? 100%. I tried to come back around, I don't but I blew it out on my right side. Is it possible to zoom in on that white? Uh... Yeah, that's very different from what we've seen before. It's almost gray in color with a little white inside. Yeah. That's uh, very different. Okay, Jonathan, we should. I should so I, I, th I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Clear water again. Roger. Can do a quick zoom for us, there. Of course. Yeah, so I think it's it's the same basic rock, but we're seeing uh, something uh, different precipitating on it. Um, and again, I would I would think that this was a, a point of a of some fluid venting at some point. Um, fresh breakaway. Oh, fresh breakaway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense, Larry. Copy. It does appear to be kind All right, your move's over, Dan, so let me know when you need another. Spray painted on. Come up five on the winch. I think I'm good for another move, Chris. Roger. Bridge, bridge now. 
Beautiful. Chris, what's our current move? Are we still kind of moseying on up? Yeah, we're moseying up until we hit the 1160 contour. Roger. And to give people at home watching on the internet an uh, idea of the, the, what we're looking at, what is the slope, do you think, of this? Uh, is this almost a vertical wall? or? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's pretty steep, so I have it pulled up here on the Norbit map. You can see how, sort of in general, how steep it is. Yeah, I think the slope of the pit wall. It looks like, yeah, it's beyond maybe 45 degrees. Yeah, it's on that order. I think we have some of these promontories, which actually form almost vertical vertical walls coming out in, into the into the pit. You can see the Norbit map in Channel Three. Have there been any ball, uh, any uh, earthquakes in the, this area yeah, in the recent past that would indicate Taken? a movement of magma underneath that's bridge, bridge now? That's a really good question, meters. John. I think the zero, six, last uh, major reported seismic activity here was a, that I read about was in 2005. And they had uh, about 100 quakes that were magnitude uh, three to four. But they were deep. They were 12 to 28 kilometers deep. So it says there's something rumbling down there in terms of the magma chamber. Yeah, but in 2005, there was also uh, a couple, uh, 5.1 and a 5.4, um, again, deep seated. So I think those, were, uh, at least in the reports I read, the last, the last that uh, reported. At one point, they actually had this uh, seamount instrumented. They had a cable put out here. So they could really monitor the activity. And I think that I think that project ended though some years ago. Oh, well, look at this! We're coming up on this extremely sharp peak. Dan is going to perform a masterful spin. Especially impressive because there's no sediment being kicked up. Magnificent images. And this is also being recorded in ultra high definition that will be possible to be projected in an IMAX format, turned into a 3D printed model and an immersive experience on the internet with a viewer can step into the caldera and move around this wall in almost a three-dimensional way and visualize it personally and immersively. It's just extraordinary. Larry, there we're seeing the same flow pattern in the basalt as we saw on the flat part of the floor. Would that indicate this was probably laid down flat initially and then uplifted? And then uh, the caldera dropped away beneath it as the magma, as it deflated or what? Look at the flow right there in the basalt. Let's do the next one, zero four five, Chris. Roger. Bridge, bridge nav, two zero zero four five.
Uh, we have a question, Jonathan. Um, so do you take the bathymetry along with the photogrammetry and superimpose them on one another? That is certainly the goal, yeah. Um, it's bathymetry and the um, photogrammetry each offer a different strength of bathymetry, namely that it doesn't really care about the water quality and it is able to penetrate and see a much, much, much uh, further than anything that the photogrammetry can. And although these cameras were uh, designed to maximize the amount of light that the ROV can put out, you can you can see that right now actually in the in the wide field camera view how every available kind of inch of the light pool is is being used. Uh, it's still just a tiny fraction of what's around us. Um, so uh, tools like the Norbit really. Um, are, are more than valuable to situational awareness and uh, helping correct the uh, accuracy of 3D models like this. But don't don't let Chris hear that. I just said that. <laughs> I'm sure he wasn't listening. No. Obviously. Most of the time I tuned Jonathan out, so it's fine. Oh, no. <laughs> Chris, I love you. Plus, I need your help with the food with uh, the offsets tonight. <laughs> um, are the sketch pad 3D models uh, of the pieces of the wall uh, to actual scale? Uh, somebody else had asked this earlier uh, when we were kind of busy. Um, like, can they be scaled up oh. to, for VR? Um, they can, yeah. Um, unfortunately, this terrain and um, some of the technical issues with the, the vehicle, normally we would put out a fiducial, so it's an object of known size, and we'd be able to scale the models based off of that. But um, perhaps we'll be able to do that a little bit later on in the dive to kind of get really nice calibration data. But for now, um, I'm just going to have to uh, scale things probably manually or with the occasional use of the lasers. There's quite a remarkable view in sat, sat feed too. You can see how sharp that ridge is. You ready for another move, Dan? Yeah, well, let's do one more and then uh, then in. let it settle out for the watch change. Or exactly. All right. Bridge, bridge nav two zero zero four five. So one of our viewers uh, sent in a very nice uh, site called. Uh, Hawaii Tracker, which gives the most recent seismic activity, and it says that uh, there was activity under the seamount at 2 a.m. HST on the 16th of July, 2022. And um, pulses of seismic energy every 15 to 20 seconds, and about two dozen 1.83 magnitude, 1.83 earthquakes. It's likely the result of magma movement beneath the seamount, but currently at that point showed no sign leading to an eruption. And we know that you know, that was uh, more than a year ago, and there certainly was an eruption. It wasn't an eruption. Yeah, time lapse video of those magma, uh, when magma moves in underneath the caldera and then it, you know, it disappears are extraordinary because it's like in the inflating and deflating of a balloon. It's just incredible. You should uh, peri periodically send out the Norbit so they can see the big picture on the sat. Yeah, these Norbit uh, images are just extraordinary.
There's uh, your Norbit view in channel three. Thank you, Manil. Uh, I like your, oh, I still have it. Never mind. I'm also thinking of the, the symmetry, looking straight down. You see that image? That one. Yeah, that's a high-pack high pack survey. Yeah, high-pack. There we go. Send that out, and they can see where we are inside the caldera. Yeah. There we are. There you go. Very cool. So the pot colors are high and the cold colors are low. You can see us coming out on a bearing of about uh, zero six zero coming out of the caldera up to the rim. Purple is the Pur ship. Purple is the ship and the little X in the black is the uh, Hercules. That shows you the mountain climbing we're doing. We have so many different displays in here. Uh, it's hard to get them all out on the satellite. You have to sort of take them all, integrate them into your head, and form an image. Fortunately, if you're dyslexic like I am, it's pretty easy. Uh, we have a question about the mapping. So is that 3D view of the multi-beam being created in real time, uh, a function of the multi-beam software itself, or is it like a custom-made program? This is a yeah, custom-made Chris program. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so we're using an off-the-shelf sensor, but all the navigation and mapping software is custom. And in real time. Yeah. And in real time. And, and, so and, and for the nerds using Ross. <laughs> settle out and, uh, we'll do a ship static. What's that, Larry? No, I, I was just saying for, for those who know what it means, it's using the ro robotics operating system as right. a, yeah. the base for all this. Yep, all built on open source <laughs> frameworks. Our target depth is 1160, so 40, 40 meters above us, and you'll probably goof around with it. For, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sea cucumber. All right. <laughs> Did Dan dress up as a sea cucumber? That is awesome. Look, Jonathan. I mean, that's, that's it's very your proud favorite. Of that. that's you need to take a picture together. I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sponsored by Trauma. Oh, uh, the cameras are poked out right now, so this wall are coming up the hill. When you uh, get up to the top and start looking around and get closer, you can suck that Larry, I noticed it's got the, uh, you see the flow pattern of the basalt right there now. along the wall. It's now uh, the at a pretty the steep down. slope on that right side of the wall. Would that indicate this was initially part of the, on the floor uh, of the caldera and then uplifted? Right no, I, I wouldn't think that, although I'm sure all kinds of radical things got, but I think we're probably more likely the part of the side. The, the, we'd expect similar sort of things along the side too, somewhere near the bottom. So we are, we're coming up to shift block. change, and I'm going to hand you over to Daniela. Going through our watch change, so a little chaos here. set up here, uh, normally we run four on eight off watches around the clock. So I have three complete teams, three navigators, three Hercules pilots, three R at Atlanta pilots, three video engineers, and on the list goes. And we're now going through that 
watch change. Harold in with it. SPL check one two. So, Larry, what people are seeing in the uh, in the sonar image is in real time synchronized with the visual image they're seeing from the camera. Is that correct? We're undergoing a bit of a shift a shift change here, so there's some. Oh yeah. A little bit of a little bit, of, as Bob says, chaos. But you are seeing in the sonar image exactly what the camera is seeing that is being broadcast uh, to you live here from NautilusLive.org. Yeah, when we're doing the shift change, when we change over, we have to brief the next um, shift. What is happening and what we're doing. So it takes us a little time to get everyone settled on in and up to speed on the ongoings of the dive. So if you bear with us just for a few more minutes and we'll do a new round of introductions for the four to eight shift. Hey, I got you. Yeah, we're holding. Just let me know when you're ready to start rolling again. We're trying to look for the uh, 1160 contour. 1160 contour, copy that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can uh, start moving if you want. Okay. Settled in. Yeah. All right, we're going to start moving 070. 070, copy that. Bridge, bridge nav, 20 meters, 070. Yeah, affirmative bridge. Uh. So, um, Simon, um, just to orient you, the cameras are currently kind of all the way thrust out, and I'm going to switch back over into photogrammetry mode. So can you pull the cameras back in? Um, and um, put the tray out to be our protective little chin again? Yeah. Someone talking to me, I couldn't quite hear anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this is Jonathan on the back row on side left. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I, could, I think the, uh, I can hear you. So, Simon, do you read? Maybe turn up your SPL channel a little bit, Simon. Yeah. No, it's it's a. Uh, uh, or I can. Uh, there you go. Hey, I'll force talk. I'll force talk, pilot. Hey, Simon, do you read me now? Go ahead and repeat that, Jonathan. Sure. Uh, Simon, if you can uh, retract the the uh, sample tray that is holding the cameras, currently the cameras are all the way out, and uh, I'm going to switch back to doing some photogrammetry. Um, I can and, go ahead and pull uh, in the trays. Yeah, so if we can with withdraw the cameras and push out the uh, port so it's a little bit more protected. You ready for a tool tray coming in? Thank you. Okay, tool tray coming in. I did. Okay, tool tray is all the way in. What was the other thing, Jonathan, that you wanted? Um, I think that that's good. You might want to tilt down Zeus to get situationally oriented of how far the tray out is out in front of the cameras. 
because I'm not sure. It looks like it's okay on the camera view on the upper right, but just want to put my little bumper guard. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you can see them now, Jonathan. Okay, tilt tray is all the way in. Yeah. Okay, there you go. That's that's perfect. Now you, now we have a little bit of a bumper guard against the. Thank you. Is everyone situated and ready for introductions, or do we need a few more moments still? All right. I think good on the side. I think we're all good. All right, Congressman, would you like to start us off? Yeah, this is former Congressman John Culberson, a, a proud member of the uh, of the board uh, that uh, this magnificent organization that Dr. Robert Ballard created and a long time uh, supporter. And, Worked very closely with Dr. Ballard to uh, help uh, ensure the success of this program that allows scientists, individuals all over the world in real time to participate through telepresence, some concept that Dr. Ballard came up with, uh, to experience what we here on the Nautilus are seeing through the eyes of these robotic uh, submarines. And that is certainly going to be the wave of the future. Start the line of fear is a great team of scientists Try and engineers. Going. And, uh, nice. And look, uh, look, look forward to to a fascinating evening exploring this uh, this crater here on the the newest part of the United States, as is being formed before our eyes here on the eastern slope of uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. All right, and over to you, Captain. Bridge, bridge oh, now. sorry. Uh, <laughs> forgot that I came the fleet here. Zero, seven, zero. Uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Feely. Um, I'm the Ocean Exploration Trust Media Producer and Winch, was the lead Winch for the development deck. of this camera system we're testing today, uh, supported by the o uh, Office of Naval Research. You can see the camera system's view. It's called the officially called the Wide Field Camera Array, um, affectionately known on the ship as Triclops. Um, and it's a system that was designed to do two things uh, very well. One is to record for kind of immersive projection, uh, kind of thing that you would wear a headset to view in VR, XR, or perhaps more profoundly um, to uh, do stuff like whole room projection and uh, project them in venues like the MGM Grand Dome. Uh, so elements like that, um, our one side of the camera system, and it's something that on the lower right-hand view, you can see a little fisheye view, 180 degrees all around you. Um, and the other element that we're doing is, is um, recording for uh, uh, photogrammetry, so using uh, moving images to create three-dimensional models of, of the worlds as we see it. And the, the penultimate goal of, of that project, uh, kind of right, right in front of us, is to create models. And eventually, those models are going to go in a near real time to a video gaming engine so that we can share the excitement of exploration um, to a new generation of viewers that want to experience this kind of um, research in uh, what, I, what I'd describe as the nonlinear experience. So an experience that goes beyond just uh, a linear video and allows you to explore it on your own. So I'm uh -huh. very excited to be here um, and continue this uh, fascinating dive on, on this uh, crater. Dan? Hi, oh, I'm Dan Dietz. Um, I'm sitting in Science Right, and I'm one of the watch leaders here today. Um, today we're exploring hydrothermal vents in a crater. Um, the plan right now is we saw a couple this morning in the earlier watches and there's been a report that uh, previous dives that there's one long essentially 1160 meters deep so we're gonna follow that sort of iso bar bath uh, same depth along and see if we can find another one that's high temperature. Um, in my day job, I am a program officer at the Office of Naval Research, where we essentially do science. So um, I work on unmanned systems, remote systems, and uh, partner with uh, my colleagues in oceanography, meteorology, acoustics, and the basic scientists. So we go everywhere from understanding basic questions of 
why do the oceans so circulate, to what's the air-sea interaction effects on hurricanes and typhoons, to developing new sensors like this here. Um, that's all. Thank you, Dan. All right, uh, Corn Man over there at the end. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I can't see anybody. There we go. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. I'm over here in the data logger position. Um, I was born and raised in Nebraska, hence the corn suit for today. Um, oh. But, uh, yeah. We should actually all describe our costumes. So, Zach, after you're done with your introduction, okay. we can say what we're all wearing. I feel like I have to explain corn, otherwise it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyways, I've been um, out here in Hawaii for the last 10 years. Um, graduate student at UH Hilo now. Um, finishing that up where my work focuses on uh, remote underwater video systems for observing uh, near, shore, near shore species. Um, but yeah, super excited to be here. And yeah. Zach, would you say you have an ear for it? I sure do. <laughs> I'm ready for all the corny jokes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and Dan, what are you supposed to be? I am a sea cucumber. Oh, is that what you are? Since we started the sea cucumber count on this watch, oh. I came as the first one. Oh, I like it. That's true. I don't see another sea cucumber in this. <laughs> Maybe a count of one today. Count of one. <laughs> and Jonathan, what are you dressed up as? Um, I've got Captain Hook here uh, back at home. Oh, my where's your hook? Oh, uh, oh well, I had to type. <laughs> Miraculously appeared out of nowhere. Uh, back at home, my uh, twins, uh, four years old, they're dressed as Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. And my wife is Wendy, so here we are. Oh, are you going to photogametry model you guys together somehow? Uh, we did indeed, but only through the magic of a Facebook post. <laughs> And I am dressed up. Are those, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, are those like little worms on that uh, rock we just passed? There's like a, on the top down view in the lower left hand side, there's like little fuzzy things that are poking off of the rock. Do you see those? I'm looking at the cinema cam that's kind of pointed downwards. And there are little worms. Bob, what do you think? I'm trying to see what you're looking at. I think to he's the gone below it now. Ah, there we go. There. The yeah, right there. Renny, you see it? I do see the fuzziness, yeah. I think we caught it. We're just trying to get it in the light pool. Are so they worms or just the uh, bacteria? You can turn on downs again, too, uh, if that helps. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm so far beyond my science right now, it's not even funny. I'm not sure what the fuzziness, if it's... Rub your eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be part of the bacterial mat? I'm not uh, sure. That's quite interesting. It's a bit far from venting for that, but it's possible um, that it's left over. Uh, huh. I don't think they're worms. I see a shrimp, <laughs> upper left. Start the shrimp count, that's oh, number one. Oh, shrimp count, all right. Okay, that ship move is complete. It looks like oh, look at that. settling. Oh, look at that. Maybe get a little bit more and we'll settle. That's a big shrimp. Um, or is that a fish? So once we are happy with Atlanta, yeah. let's, um, we're about at the ISO bar we need, the contour line, so we can Kind of follow this a bit. Roger, where do you see that? All right, well, we'll continue on with our introduction. My name is Daniela Griffay, and I'm the Science Communication Fellow on board EV Nautilus for the 4 to 8 shift. 
When I'm not on here, I am a high school teacher at Radford High School, which is located over in Honolulu, Hawaii, over by Pearl Harbor. I teach marine science and AP environmental science, and today I am my octopus teacher. It's a really cute documentary on Netflix that I think everyone should go and check it out. Oh. Hence why I'm wearing my glasses today. Make me look a little more teachery. <laughs> All right, Dave, over to you. I'm uh, Peter Venkman, leader of the Ghostbusters. <laughs> I have, I don't know, six or eight uh, Halloween t-shirts. And a couple of months ago when I was packing to come out here, I realized that we were going to be here for uh, Halloween. And so I grabbed a t-shirt that has uh, the Ghostbusters uniform on it. Another shirt. Uh, Dave Robertson, uh, video engineer. And uh, zooming in on things when they ask me to. So we have this ridge here in front of us. So uh, when we do follow the general line to the south, we're obviously going to come off the ridge and be a little deeper than our 1160. Um, I don't know how much we want to interrogate the uh, we could we could inch it closer and stay here, but it kind of like flattens out above. So it's up to you guys if you want to kind of go a bit. Maybe up and over it. Maybe so up and over it. Yeah, continue just on a little that bit. way and beer. Should go to the wall. You got it on your sonar. Okay, Roger. I'll just go another 20 um, in the direction we were going. Roger. I'll go 20 meters, 080. Zero zero. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. I'm lost at the zoom. Uh, yeah, is that the direction you're? Straight ahead's a wall. Yeah. I'll bring you a little closer um, east, and then we can move along it. Uh, so, Atalanta, I'll go just 090, zero, 20 meters. Bridge now. Good afternoon. Step 20 yeah, meters, bearing 090. Zero, Thank you, Martina. It'll take you right to the wall. I just drive the ridge line. You'll see the wall on the sonar. Off to the right. Uh, Zach, yep. I'm going to be changing the frequency of the photos to once every four seconds. Okay, got it. There we go. Are you able to introduce yourself for us? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Mike Burns. I am currently uh, dressed up in my Halloween costume of a Nautilus deck chief. <laughs> <laughs> You're very convincing in that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike Burns, uh, Atalanta pilot, uh, also a deck chief on, on board, uh, professional mariner for the last 10 years plus. Um, Right, over to you, Simon. Are you? Oh, we can't hear you, Simon. Can't You're hear not you. on SPL. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, hi, I'm Simon Jones. I'm uh, your uh, Hercules pilot for today. Originally born in the UK, now a Canadian uh, citizen living on the east coast of Canada in lovely Nova Scotia. Uh, been an ROV pilot for uh, around 17 years and uh, three years in the science community and absolutely loving it. And then over to you, Renny. Hi, Renato Kane here, um, navigator on this watch. I'm uh, Robert Ballard. I'm a president of the Ocean Exploration Trust that owns and operates the EV Nautilus. I'm also a professor in the Graduate School of Oceanography in Nova Seward Island. And uh, I've been at this game 62 years. That's good. We'll just jump over. 
maybe veer to the right a little and get around this guy. It's so what we're currently doing right now is just uh, moving along the ridge and trying to find any further evidence of hydrothermal vents. Yeah, I'd like to add that uh, this expedition is being sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, which has uh, supported me since I first was an ensign in the U.S. Navy in 1967 and uh, signed to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Over the intervening years, uh, the ONR has pioneered the development of visual imaging systems that we've used to, to make lots and lots of discoveries. And now we're really taking it to another level of complexity and being able to create a totally immersive technology uh, that'll eventually make it possible for you to remotely operate vehicle systems as if you are a fish. I would say it's absolutely impressive what they've been able to do here. Um, you can see on satellite feed, uh, satellite B3, you know, we have the Sigma camera that's high definition, and then we have the two fisheye lenses that really provide a situational awareness that um, surpasses uh, what current technology has done. Probably want to be slightly lower than 160 because if there's something happening, it'll go downhill. <laughs> Dave, we have viewers that are asking if they can see our costumes. Could you give them a quick view of what we look like in the back row here? Uh, right now, the science is uh, taking precedence over uh, costumes. Sounds good. I think, unless somebody uh, wants to. I'd, I'd like to keep the uh, track laps camera up. So uh, here we are oh, uh, just now. I is think that a goose fish? So we'll have a little. Oh little more sway Could here. Do more photogrammetry. Um, and then from there, I think we'll be moving roughly yeah, south. Yeah, actually. Um, around here, around the crater. Uh, science, if possible, could we do just a real quick, kind of focus in on that goosefish and do just a little drive-by, lateraling across it so I can... We see it in the triclops yeah, there, oh, yeah. so it's a bit lower. Yeah, a bit lower there. It's another really excellent, because of the different orientation and the wide field of the triclops we can see so many animals before they kind of pop up on the regular here's on, uh, a Zeus. here's a fish dressed up for halloween <laughs> is it dressed up as a moose fish yep it's got Ooh. his little feet on his little slippers only his mother can love him but anyway <laughs> i was reading a paper earlier about um these hydrothermal vents and they said that goose fish this is one of the main fish that we saw in these areas here Oh, look at him. It, look at it, cute. Yeah, actually, I, I haven't seen, I've seen a lot of hydrothermal vents. I haven't seen too many of these characters that live in them. A uh, whole new ecosystem. This is a fairly uh, common pelagic fish uh, that lives in the deep sea, independent of whether this chemosynthetic process is going on or not. But he's really quite a cutie. Well, mm -hmm. you want to zoom in on him and see how he's all dressed up for Halloween. He seems to be extra spiky. Uh, yep, when are you ready? That's a nice slow zoom, Dave. He looks so lonely. Didn't shave this morning. Looks like he's lost an eye. Yeah. And our it's goose a pirate fish. goose fish. <laughs> it does, yeah. Oh, he's a pirate. Did lose. Yeah. Hi, call this highlight one-eyed goosefish. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one on Atalanta as well. Okay. He's reminiscent of a, a, a puffer a fish. Well, oh. Can he inflate to make himself hey, me. less desirable to eat? I don't believe this this fish inflates. No. Spikes do a good job all by themselves. Would you like to go to the summit? Okay. Uh, we will go up to the summit then. We'll continue on that move zero, um, zero 090. Zero. Roger. Bridge now. And Dr. Ballard, I was wondering why uh, we have let's a. Step 
three zero meters bearing zero nine zero. We have a question in the chat saying, how much time was there between the lava rolling out and the crust falling down? Do you know the answer to that? Can you repeat that? I'm not sure I follow that question. Yeah, the um, chat is asking, how much time was there between the lava rolling out and the crust falling down? is how they worded that question. I think they mean between the eruption and then like, did this um, part of the seamount get covered for a bit too? Uh, actually, what you're looking at is largely talus. That is really uh, gravitational. I mean, you're basically seeing a lot of landslide activity associated with here. I see no recent uh, volcanism. Uh, volcanism uh, and certainly where I've spent most of my time in the mid-ocean ridge is, is episodic and then you have a lot of tectonic activity associated with it. Well, most likely what you're looking at here is a collapsing of the caldera walls. Just like you see in any active volcano, you also get seismic activity that can also contribute to collapse. And then we have someone in the chat asking, what happened to Argus? So why are we using Atalanta instead of Argus for this expedition? Well, actually, uh, oh, Dr. Ballard, I can't hear you on SPL. We have, yes, we have two different vehicles, Argus and Atalanta. And uh, we're really getting some experience with Atalanta. Atalanta is particularly useful. Oh when we go down to uh, 6,000 meters, because as you put out more and more cable, you're putting more and more weight on your cable. And at Atlanta weighs a lot less than Ar Ar Argus. Ship's moving, you might just uh, have to wait for that move a little bit. Hey, uh, Simon? Yep. Could I get the uh, porch back by four inches or so? Yep, I'll do that. Yep. Um, I don't know if this was... Yep, that's nope. good. Thank you. Oh, yes. Simon, I'm going to put you back on DVL. We've just been running on Doppler right now. Right to that. Um, we'll see if that behaves. Zach, I'm stopping. Uh, the photogrammetry for the moment while the ship catches up. Oh, yeah. You're on Doppler for now. That's all right. Yeah, that's good. So someone in the chat is commenting about the goosefish and our comment, um, the congressman asked if it can blow itself up. And the chat is saying uh, that they can to some small extent. It's more a function of their ability to breathe. So since the goosefish is an anglerfish and anglerfish are ambush predators, how the fish holds its breath for such a long period so that it doesn't move is by taking in large amounts of water and being able to actually recirculate the water across its gills as it um, allows them to remain as still as possible um, and better able to ambush its prey. Neat. Cool. And then the chat is asking if Mini Herc got the parts that it needed to be fixed. Um, they thought there was some thing about it being able to return to shipwrecks hmm. this expedition. We do not have Mini Herc on board. So it will not be turn returning to any shipwrecks on board. Um, yeah. Yeah, the prime uh, use of what we call Little Herc, uh, it can go deeper than Hercules. Hercules it can go to a depth of 4,000 meters, whereas uh, Little Herc can go to a depth of 6,000 meters. And earlier in our operating season, we were working uh, at the site where we discovered the USS aircraft Yorktown that played a pivotal role in the Battle of Midway. And to get down there 
uh, we wanted to take Little Herc. Uh, the other vehicles can also go down there, but they're not ROVs. They don't have the maneuverability that the Hercules and Little Herc have. So uh, our goal is to be able to upgrade a Little Herc, a Big Herc, to 6,000 meters. Uh, but it's not a, a it's not an inexpensive thing to do. So if we had the resources, we'd have a 6,000 meter Hercules, but we don't. Yes, so viewers, if you have not seen that footage of the uh, Yorktown vessel, you should go over to nautiluslive.org and check out the highlights for sure. those. It is really, really impactful in watching that and also just appreciating the history of it as well. Another shrimp. So does that bring us up to three? Oh. Four. Four. Oh. And one goosefish. It's a big day. Oh, is that? Did you already count that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, floaty, floaty shrimp got counted. I'm glad we're in an ROV. This is a tough walk up this. <laughs> To slide right down. I feel like I've done hikes that look a lot like this, and they are a little sketchy. It's always a loose gravel, you know. So, Dr. Ballard, the uh, chat is wondering how much would it cost for a new Hercules that could dive to 6,000 meters? About six million. You want to write in your cards and letters? We're more than happy to take a tax-deductible donation. <laughs> Support ocean research. Exploration. Well, it really would be quite remarkable to have a 6,000-meter vehicle as capable as Hercules. Little Hercules uh, is really uh, more of a lighting and camera platform uh, lacks the manipulators or the size and momentum of a vehicle like Hercules. But we were thinking ahead um, and the design of the uh, Triclops uh, wide field camera array here, that they are all rated for 6,000 meters, been pressure tested all the way out to 6,600 meters for a 10% safety margin. So the day that that new 6,000 meter rated Hercules comes, we're, uh, we're ready. Simon and Mike, as our ROV engineers on board, what would you say is that would be the difficulty of, besides the money aspect of it, about getting Hercules able to reach that 6,000, go from 4,000 to 6,000? You're not on SPL, Simon. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, yeah, I mean, the syntactic foam that uh, keeps Hercules the right way up and uh, takes away the, some of the mass effect of the of the ROV in the water would be need to be operated and every single instrument on board from the from the sonar to the cameras to you know the uh, electric motor and hydraulic pumps all have to be rated for those for those kinds of depths so yeah it's, they are why those parts are widely available but as Dr. Ballard said it's uh, an expensive operation to get those extra couple of thousand meters there are commercial ROVs that dive to that can dive to 4,000 meters, but um, yeah, we have to, some modifications have to be made for that extra couple of thousand. What a remarkable view there on satellite feed two of 
video. You want to put a high pack image up there for a few minutes just so they can see the lay of the land and you'll see the caldera that we're summiting. We'll put it up on the satellite. Yeah, we have so many different displays down here and unfortunately we can't get them all out. There you go. If you look at uh, channel three, That's you'll remarkable. see the caldera, the green bullseye is the caldera and we're just on the western perimeter of it summiting you'll see that purple object that is uh, Nautilus and then b directly beneath Nautilus is at Atlanta we like to have a near vertical angle so we can spin on our on our cable and then Hercules and Hercules very much like walking the dog it has a leash uh, if you look at uh, I are we sending out at Atlanta? You, yeah, if you look at that Atlanta, you'll see Hercules down there, and then you'll see that catenary. Uh, we call them uh, footballs, swimming. And those are pieces of syntactic foam that make a loop. So the last thing we want is for Hercules to be taunt on its, on its leash, much like when you're walking the dog. You don't want to be constantly jerking its head. So we uh, have a dance going on between the bridge, the navigator, pilot of Hercules, pilot of Argus that make it possible for Hercules to be working and never know it's on a leash. Someone in the chat was asking about the next expedition. Um, so if you go to nautiluslive.org, you can click over on the expedition. It'll show all of our past expeditions as well as all our future expeditions. But our next expedition will be on November 7th through the 17th, and it's Hawaii mapping. And it's going to be kind of looking at the economic exclusion zone. You're kind of within 100 nautical miles of the Hawaiian Islands. And so while a lot is known and mapped around the area right around Hawaii, it's not much is known about the rest of this economic exclusion zone. So we are going to be undertaking a deep sea mapping operations. And then following that expedition, we then are going to continue on with our mapping and we're going to do Jarvis Island mapping and that'll be from November 19th through December 19th and that will be our last expedition. And this one will be around Jarvis Island, which is one of the most poorly mapped areas under the U.S. jurisdiction. And so we're going to be using high-resolution bathymetric seafloor mapping. And it'll just add to our world's baseline knowledge. So uh, less than 5% of the ocean's floor have been mapped. And so we're trying to do a good effort at increasing I'll this Sorry, I'll correct that right there. It's 25% of oh, the is ocean's, it? Sorry. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, seafloor has been mapped. 25%. And it's a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. In fact, uh, about 52% of the United States is uh, beneath the sea. And believe it or not, we have better maps than Mars than half the United States. So uh, that's what our mission is from NOAA, NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. Uh, the trust is part of what's called the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. And our job is literally to, to do this second Lewis and Clark expedition. Although since uh, many of our members are women, we call it the Lois and Clark Expedition. So uh, we like have that. fundamentally uh, the exclusive economic zone represents five Louisiana purchases. So uh, Lewis and Clark were able to do their job in a couple of years. Uh, we have a 10-year 10 10 program to map and characterize America. So we're ha not quite halfway through. And to orient folks who are watching on the internet, uh, oh, what is the slope, is slope of this? Uh, how steep is this slope we're looking oh, right at? Right there on the, on the uh, is a sea cucumber. Uh, Can anybody talk to oh, us about Oh, sea cucumber. <laughs> Number one. This is scintillating. our first one. Yeah. 
Should I highlight that number five? Of course. And then, sorry, you were asking, you're a little quiet, so maybe try and move the mic a little yeah, closer. Yes, so I was going to ask about the steepness of this slope we're looking at. Looks to be nearly vertical, but that may be an optical illusion. How steep is that? Yeah, it's difficult to say, so there's going to be a lot of, um, we've got the different resolution maps as we go down. Um, probably one of the better views to understand how steep it is would be the Norbit. Um, that's currently uh, using, using multi-beam sonar that's mounted to the ROV to get a, a sense. So we've got a, a real Hercules in there. So it's it's not as, as steep as as, uh, as vertical as it seems um, in front of us, but uh, that's there are certainly sections that are that are more wall-like than others. It looks like we're at a depth about 1114 uh, meters. What uh, depth do you expect the summit to be? Yeah, um, so... I don't know why you lost. I think it'll be another maybe yeah. 20 meters, 10 to 20 meters to get to the um, this, just the summit of this kind of caldera rim on the eastern right, flank. Right. Um, we're just kind of going up there and checking it out once we once we see it. Um, I think we'll end up kind of returning back to our 1160 contour and following it along um, to see if we can locate uh, some of the higher temperature events that were seen in the in the 90s. I don't know how often they were revisited. Um, the sites that we revisited in 2018 um, to have some temperature sensors. They were closer to the base of the, or sorry, the, uh, yeah, kind of the base, the center of the caldera, not as high up as that. So um, not sure if those ones at 1160 are still uh, active, um, but we'll, we'll go and check it out. That's kind of what we're in. It's a little bit of sure. exploration mode right now, um, informed exploration. I, it looked like earlier that the uh, volcan the vent, the hydrothermal vent, that we spotted earlier, uh, the hot water that was rising out of it was visible on the sonar. Uh, will that be possible? We'll be able to see vents before we get to them and from what distance, if they are visible? It, it very well may be. Um, some of, I, I'd have to see what that signature looked like if it was just, if it looked like a little bit of an anomalies and it was one of those things, well, we can confirm because we're seeing it, you know, yeah. that it, we see it in the sonar. I don't know that we'd be individually be able to pick it out um, well ahead of time. Also, that multi-beam sonar is, is a fan shape, so we'd have to kind of be in a position that would get, um, that would pick that up within that thin slice. Um, yeah. So It'll we'll, we'll continue to kind of, as we, as we go around, we've been spinning and kind of keeping an eye on that. It, it appeared to be a, a vertical uh, white, uh, series of white uh, dashes moving upward that emanated from the spot where we had visually confirmed the vent. So it looked like it was picking up the column of moving water moving upward, which uh, is very intriguing because we could see it from a distance. Well, yeah, we do see that with um, with the gas seeps. That's really clear in the sonar. It is very clear gas seeps. Yeah, yeah the, the water a the bit movement. less so, um, but yeah. you can see sometimes that temperature uh, difference and it could be that uh, I don't know if there's any any sort of dissolved uh, gas in, in those seeps that are in these hydrothermal vents that are kind of being picked up that could be the case as well yeah it um, appeared to be gonna step another step here just to get a little bit closer Roger that. bridge now Rennie, would you mind three zero meters bearing zero nine zero Rennie, would you. you mind explaining to our viewers how to read that bathymetric map that we have up on satellite V3? Uh, Dave, what do you have up on satellite 3? Uh, right now it's Norbit. Oh, Norbit. Norbit. Yeah, Sorry. sure. You know, that, that is, uh, it's currently, it's being collected, a uh, bathymetric map that's being collected. So, um, it, I can't tell. It looks like it may have been shut off, but I can describe it a bit. Um, I think that might have been on K2's end. Um, but uh, multi-beam sonar works. Uh, so first, first things is we're we're kind of we're sending a sound out into the water column, and then we're waiting for a return, uh, an echo off of the uh, surface and back. 
So we are transmitting a sound and we have a receive sound. So that's kind of that's kind of how the principles of sonar works and, and multi-beam sonar works in a way where you can um, uh, arrange uh, those sound elements, those transducers in a way. Um, so I'm going to try to describe this as quick as I can rather than as thorough. Uh, so if you uh, mount a transceiver array, so this is what is sending a signal out in the same direction as your uh, as your vessel, in this case an ROV, but it could be a ship, um, so kind of a long track. Um, the way that we call it beam forming, the way that those uh, transducer elements uh, cancel, there's a bit of canceling out of sound and there's a bit of uh, shaping the cone of sound. If you think about a flashlight as a point source and it kind of like shines out into a bigger cone, the circle is bigger than the flashlight. Um, it's a bit like that, but we can actually squinch that circle into an oval and keep keep uh, uh, getting it thinner and thinner um, until you have just a, a really thin ellipse. It's kind of like a sliver, and that's kind of what you're seeing with that blue uh, sliver there um, from what was once the uh, the Nexus being um, being. Hercules. Uh, then we can listen on a receiver array that's mounted um, perpendicular to that. And so we can kind of take that same beam forming concept and uh, turn it at, our, at a 90 degree angle and uh, collect a single point. Um, we can use, then use beam steering to listen um, to slivers of that transmit. Uh, that's a lot of complicate, complicated way of saying we can collect uh, three-dimensional points based on time of flight um, through the water column. Uh, so that's kind of what that red is showing is those are, uh, that's a map that's been created um, based on that uh, Norbing. I do have to, let me see if Chris is down there. It looks like it's turned off. Yeah, I'll look at that. Oh, it's back. There it goes. <laughs> so, Renny, correct me if I'm wrong on anything I say here, but I think um, on our descent, we stop at a certain depth to, to kind of take this Norbit scan and help us kind of also guide our dive, plan our okay. waypoints, and really make sure we're going of areas of interest. Is that correct? Um, kind of. Yeah, so we, we have our kind of multi-level, uh, multi-resolution uh, maps, so we can collect maps uh, we can collect data to create maps from the ship um, with multi-beam sonar, and then this area, um, there was an AUV, um, an autonomous underwater vehicle, uh, that was kind of in the water column a bit closer to the seafloor and collected a higher resolution map of about five meters, and then we have been um, running our uh, sonar on the ROV even closer to the surface to get um, hopefully sub-meter um, resolution, in, but in a very small area. So if the if the, uh, if the Norbit is still up on the on the satellite, you can watch as I rotate the ROV around now, kind of counterclockwise, and you can see that beam moving and filling in the little gaps that were not there. So hopefully, as I as I rotate round around, if you can if you're still watching the Norbit screen, you can yeah. So you can see as I. As I move the ROV, that uh, that line of sound there is moving and filling in the, the area as we, as I come round, and that should hopefully fill in the uh, the area that we missed. Yeah. Simon, the chat is asking, how many passes do we usually have to make to get a good map? Is there a number of passes? I think with the multi-beam sonar, we can we can pretty much get a lot of data in a single. A uh, single pass here, you can see as it's writing in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, it was, if it was complex geology that had a lot of shadows in, then maybe we might go in for, for other areas to fill in areas that were shadowed. You know, like light, the sound travels pretty much in a straight line. So, you know, anything sticking out will cause a shadow in the sound, which is how we kind of detect things underwater. We get a, a reflection back from solid objects. And uh, the sonar screen that we've got from our ones that sweep around in a circle will uh, be uh, devoid of any information behind a behind a walled structure if it appears before us. 
someone says it's Minecraft ROV and it's not just games for kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that just happens to be the uh, kind of the visual display that we're showing here is these uh, these three-dimensional boxes. Winch, come up five meters, please. Um, and we had a viewer who said that they like to listen to our dives and that sh they're 50, but uh, makes them want to go back to school for oceanography, but they feel they're too old, and I don't think you're ever too old to do that. Dan, no, what do you I, think? Oh, speaking personally, I didn't start my... Uh, my studies in my degree until I was over 30. Uh, I didn't complete it. I did it part-time through a, something called the Open University in the UK. And yeah, I, did, I graduated only 10 years ago, so I was 42 when I graduated from university, effectively. So never too old. Yes, never too old to I learn. I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with them. You're never yeah. too old. And oceanography, lots of, uh, lots of times, it's core sciences. So that's usually a master's or a PhD level. So you're not going back as, you don't have to go back as an a undergrad. undergrad. You can go back as master's or PhD student. Yeah. yeah. And then and your life experience is going to prepare you significantly more. Yes. Um, and then here's a fun question. Do you think there, does anyone think there are mythological ocean creatures that could be down here? Someone like the Kraken or the Blob? And speaking of, or the bloop, is that B L O P? The bloop, bloop? yeah, is there, there, that was a sound heard. that was picked up. Oh. Um, there's the Julia sound and there's the bloop. There are sounds that were picked up um, that were kind of triangulated from multiple uh, sensors, motion, multiple um, hydrophones that would imply that it traveled very far in the ocean. Um, I think some of the theories about it um, settle in ice calving. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in kind of looking that up, um, some believe maybe it was a biological signature. I don't know that that was really ever kind of proven. But as far as, uh, there are certainly creatures we have not discovered, uh, species we have not discovered in the ocean yet. Um, whether or not a very large uh, creature with a uh, population enough to support reproduction uh, yeah. has has evaded us is uh, uh, less and less likely, likely but yeah. anything's Don't possible. strip me of my hopes for Megalodon. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. It's down here. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as you said, I mean, some of the life forms you encounter, you know, are so strange and so alien looking to us that it's, uh, yeah, it's, some of it is just defies imagination. If you gave someone a pen and paper and asked them to draw some strange creature, they couldn't come up with some of the things that actually exist down here in the ocean. Absolutely. Although um, some of them also even seem like a little kid did dr create them, like the googly eye squid. It feels like some kid just bridge, no. <laughs> did some googly eyes on a squid, you know, like. Hold position here. Thank you. Okay. Well, we know that, the, you know, we know that, that there's some, a giant squid. I mean, you can go to Smithsonian, and it's crater. all there in the ocean, it looks uh, like ocean it uh, pavilion. It uh, does, yeah. So, so it, I can that's see also uh, even older uh, ancestor of the giant squid gave rise to the Kraken legend. Let me just uh, step in here, Dan. Um, so we have uh, kind of reached the crest of the summit here. Okay. Um, kind of the ridge uh, crest of the crater, if you're looking at high pack right here. Um, it was the intent to kind of take a look at it, and I think um, uh, we were going to go back down to 1160 and track along to see if we could find that, um, that event from the, uh, that was kind of uh, seen in the in the late 90s, but I'll take your direction if you have some other uh, thoughts. That is my understanding uh, of okay. what Dr. Ballow wanted to do. Okay, um, that being said, um, we will be going down slope, so we can do our best to view, but we're gonna be backing off, which will keep Atalanta safe, but as we're doing that, especially with this uh, this remote winch situation, we'll, we'll do our best to keep seafloor in view and keep the vehicle safe, but we'll be kind of going a bit downslope and backwards, so just get All right. ready. Science Lab, do you want to stop taking photogrammetry pictures as we go down? Um, I'd say that the only reason I would want to do that or immersive would be to see um, if we see any like exceptional columns or obvious signs that look a little bit more volcanic. Otherwise, I'd, I'd probably prefer to be just boogie. Okay. Okay, and Dan, just uh, as we're looking here, is there a... Um, 
Is there? We can just kind of go back to where we left off, back That's, around here. That sounds like the, sure. that sounds like a good plan. Okay, we'll do that. Um, and just to keep in mind, we got about two hours and fifteen minutes left on the. Ooh. Road. Yep. Ooh, oh, what's that? Fireworks starfish. Ooh. Uh, fireworks starfish. Oh, 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 oh. Let's get that. What is it? I'm going to make that call while we um, while we transition here and look at this thing. Oh, is that in small. Hercules or Atalanta? Data, he's starting. It's in her. Uh, and it's Bridge gone. now. Cool. Five zero meters, bearing mm. two oh, seven right zero. There. It's an animal. Yeah. Thank you. And could you repeat the name of that um, animal? I don't know. I've seen something similar in a different area of the Pacific, and it just looked like a firework. It was it, it oh, oh my! Yeah, it go. withdraws all its. Uh, I think that's exactly what I saw further south in the in the Pacific. Wow. Shooting. You you could not make up these creatures. It's just extraordinary. What what do you all think that is? What what is that? Some I think kind it's a type of jellyfish. But jelly, uh, yeah. I don't think it's a tinafore. I think it's a jelly. It's definitely not a tinafore. No, yeah, I think that's yeah. a jelly. You want to try for a zoom, Sam? Can we zoom uh, in? Yeah. I'm calling it a firework jelly. There oh, is there is one called a firework jelly. Oh, look at the little guy. Are you going immersive? Yeah, I'm going immersive. Dad, did you get that he started immersive? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it seems that you, when you creep up on them, they retract all of the. Uh, I think I got a couple of photographs of one from the, from the Pacific, and it was pretty spectacular. No. He, he does not like company. He doesn't. No, no. Okay, Mike. We tried. Uh, Mike, I uh, every all the moves should be pulling you away from the wall. We're going to be on two seven zero. Oh, there he is again. Um, yeah. So we'll be descending down safely, so. but. Um, Try to keep everything in view as uh, after we're done with this jelly here. Roger that. Yeah, my uh, I'm starting to get pulled on the umbilical. Yeah. Okay. You can see here our track that we've been. Uh, yeah. <laughs> follow, <laughs> jelly following. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I'm trying to go back up there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think something's around like a little octopus or something. <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like around. I'm oh, going to stop recording. This is silly. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to see anything. I don't care how many <laughs> pixels there are. Do and we I, an effort was made. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming back now. <laughs> do we still want to keep um, the Norbit on our satellite feed 3, or do we want to switch oh, no. it to Triclops? I like oh, that. Look oh, at that. No, it's already switched over there. Huh? Well, um, oh, the Norbit's well. pretty impressive. The no, Norbit's going out on Sat Feed 3. That's probably delayed. Oh, okay. There so we reached the summit at a depth of about uh, 1,070, 60 meters. Yeah, something in there. And I'm all stop on uh, recording. Zach? Roger that. Probably that. Dragon Argus quite a bit. Yeah, now I'm trying to trying to come back round onto. All right, and the chat is commenting that there doesn't seem to be a lot of animals here, and they're wondering if that's due to depth, current, or possibly instability. So, Zach, do you have any ideas or thoughts on that? Um, I think it'd be partially everything, but I think a lot of it, yeah, is just the uh, like limited number of resources for you know anything to survive. Um, yeah, there, there's not much, you know, benthic structure going on um, that's alive, and and you know, as reefs get more complex or as areas get more kind of like foundational life, other things can grow. Um, but here, I mean, these couple of fish we see and the shrimps we're seeing uh, could figure out a way to use very little energy. Um, but yeah, a lot of it always comes back to the energetics in the ocean, and can they get enough back for what they have to put out to get things and and we have to keep in mind too that this is area is very right, young earth this very, is pretty yeah. in the grand scheme of things it is very very young and it takes a while in the deep sea to build up the um energy resources we 
you do have some bacterial microbial mats here, right. but if you're thinking of the older, okay. more established okay. hydrothermal vents, you have to remember that oh. those are yeah. thousands Coming of years old years. versus yeah. tens of 30 some years old. Yeah. Right, or just exactly. drive over by the uh, airport near Kona on that part of the island. You've got very fresh lava flows and almost no life on them. Yeah. Maybe a few scattered plants. And as I learned from uh, Dr. Ballard, uh, very clear mid-ocean water has very little life in it. That's why it's clear. And a cubic yard of clear mid-ocean water has less life in it than a cubic yard of Sahara Desert sand. So Zach's exactly right. There's very little to eat. There's uh, no place to hide for the little guys. And if there's no place to hide for the small animals, then the bigger animals are not going to be there uh, who could eat them. So the food chain is not there. Uh, this is a brand new landscape, as you say, and it's um, uh, it's going to take time for life to get a hold. Exactly. This is what we'd call primary succession in the marine ecosystem. So this is new land, and it takes time to build up and establish those ecosystems here. We're looking at uh, new... Uh, real estate in Hawaii in, uh, what, uh, maybe another million years or so? Yeah. <laughs> this, will, <laughs> this will be a part of this of uh, the state maybe of Maybe not a million years. I think Long just, time. I, I, think I, I think it will, you could start to see that growth, too, and stuff like that in, like, a hundred years or so, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it it's, may pop its head above the water. It, it's happened yeah. in Iceland before very quickly. Yeah. But we have a good question here of how long does it usually take things like corals and deep water fish to mature? And it really depends on the species. There's such a wide range here that there's not a simple answer for that because you have lots of different types of corals and lots of different types of fish. So, but everything in the deep part of the ocean does tend to have a moves pretty slow and that goes for maturity as well. Yeah, at that point, you're you're really looking at the life history characteristics, right, which yeah. make up that, that species. Those aren't things that are going to change anytime soon. Um, and it varies even on the reef. Um, it's a big thing that dictates, you know, what, what fish are able to move to a new location and settle there as well. And um, it's one of the reasons it explains why we don't have many uh, groupers here in Hawaii other than the ones that have kind of been introduced because their larval phase is so short they can't even make the drift over here. Um, and then, yeah, it takes a while to mature. So... It's really interesting. Um, on the reef, a lot of people are typically surprised, including myself, but they found a lot of the small reef fish. Those ones are living up to 50, 60 years, some of them. Um, and they're little fish that don't grow bigger than 20 centimeters, but um, they just mature slow and, and grow slow, but they, they last a long time. And that's why, like, on the other hand, we have pelagic fish, things like mahi-mahi or things that don't live more than 10 years, but they mature in a couple and then they just grow rapidly. So. There's a reason you see so much pelagic fish um, compared to reef fish, because reef fish just can't handle pressure. Um, and I'd assume these deep sea are pretty similar in that, too. You could pretty easily wipe out a population, because their characteristics aren't ones that's going to replenish them very quickly if they do get a big hit. So, yeah, they're really interesting when you get into that part of it. Okay. Bridge staff. Uh, Zach, I also want to ask if there are one more step. Uh, there are there currents Five zero that dominate the zero. Hawaiian island chain that, that bring in. Thank you. For example, as a as a Houstonian, uh, born and raised in Houston, I'm familiar with the with the with the, with the currents of the Gulf of Mexico yeah, off of Galveston that sweeps in anywhere. from the east, carrying sediment from the yeah, Mississippi and down. the Brazos okay. uh, rivers. Uh, winch, there's winch, a, you know, the Humboldt control, current uh, sweeping in from the north of the meters. California right. coast. What, are there are there dominant currents in the Hawaiian island chains that bring in nutrients and are, are, a, are a major factor in the weather patterns under the ocean? Yeah, I think there, there certainly is. Um, one of the most famous ones runs between here, the island of Hawaii, and Maui, um, and that's a very strong area. It's very difficult to get through, um, even to the point where they say some fish have different genetics of the same species on opposite sides of that current because they can't even get through it. It almost oh, serves wow. as a barrier. Um, so, yeah, there definitely is. Um, I'm not up to...